from First Paw Media, sponsored by First Paw Coffee Company. This is the Dog Driver Show. Visit our website at dogworksradio.com. Now here are your hosts, Robert Forto and Kurosh Parto. Hello and welcome everybody. This is Robert Forto and I'm here with my co-host Kurosh Parto. We are the Dog Driver Show. And today we have a guest calling in from Michigan. KP, who do we have? Uh, today we have a, uh, a very good open driver and stage driver uh, from the lower 48, uh, Bruce Magnuson, uh, with us. Uh, I had the opportunity to race and see him uh, when he came up to Alaska uh, a few years ago. And uh, we did uh, rendezvous together. We had breakfast together, actually. And it was really, really fun uh, to see him uh, bringing his dogs uh, from the pedigree stage stop uh, to uh, uh, Ferrandi and run them through the streets uh, after coming from the mountains in Wyoming. Uh, Bruce, welcome to the show. And uh, tell us a little bit about uh, yourself, your background, and how you started in this sport. Well, thank you much, guys. Thank you for what you do for the sport. This is an awesome thing. I got started in dogs with my dad about 2002. My dad retired, and he ran uh, dogs or Labradors behind a sled, and then he retired, and he met Lloyd Gilbertson in the UP and started getting sled dogs. And then one day he went racing, and I said, man, I got to go see what this crazy guy's doing up north. And I went and helped him out, and he got more and more dogs, and I got hooked. And in 2005, I broke off. He retired, and I broke off and started my own kennel. And from there, I uh, got introduced to Stay Stop through Lloyd Gilbertson and Doug Swinley and sat there at a table with Doug and said, you know, I'm not ready to do this. And he said, if you wait till you're ready, we'll never see you. And that was about the only button I needed to push to go to my first Stay Stop. <laughs> that is that is a good, great story. We uh, interviewed one of the other uh, competitors uh, in that race. He almost had the same story with uh, Doug Swingley. Talked to Austin Forney uh, and uh, uh while ago and uh, we talked about the same uh tell me about the pedigree race you've raced pedigree many many times and tell us about the challenges and how this race has evolved over the years bruce so my first day stop was 2006 and we still had camp outs then we had 75 mile legs um and it that was the last year that there was a camp out from there we went down to many years at having 60 mile legs everything was 45 to 60 and then uh, as a group, uh, we got down to uh, 13 of us were consistently coming. And we, you know, the, the race asked. The race is very open. The directors, Teasley, Dan Carter, they're phenomenal, Warren Palfrey. And they said, what can we do to entice people? And we said, we think we got to go longer or shorter because we're on an island by ourselves. And they took the bold stance to try to go shorter. And we and it worked out fantastic. Some of the best drivers from Canada, open class sprinters, have now been enjoying stage stop. Um, and it, I think it also allowed and opened up the door for me to change what I was doing a little bit. And I think it, op- you know, I've now I go to the pond Canada and made my first trip to Alaska and will definitely be back next year. And the only thing that, so all that's changed about stage stop. Now we do 30 and 35 miles, but the one thing that hasn't changed about stage stop, and I just sat down with myself last year and said that, the race is still one going uphill. <laughs> Speaking of going uphill, uh, Bruce, uh, you come from an area uh, same as my uh, kennel partners, Michigan, flat, flat, flat. How do you prepare your dogs coming from flat ground going up and down those mountains in Wyoming? Well, I think there's, I don't think there's any one answer to preparing the dog team for this because, you know, Buddy's train is pretty flat, stays away from the hills. But we do slow work on ATV, uh, ATV pulling. We have a little bit on the hills. Um, in the UP up here, we're fortunate to get on sleds pretty early. Most of the time last year was an anomaly. We did not. We had to leave early. Um, but I think it's just uh, good slow work um, and, you know, making, making, a, making for an honest dog team. And uh, how many dogs do you have in your program you prepare for those races? So cur- currently, I'm ho- actually next year, I'm hoping to bring a puppy team back to stage stop and with me to Alaska as well. So currently, I'm training 30 yearlings or adults. I have 20 retired dogs, and I have 10 three-week-old puppies. That's a perfect number for the team, I guess. Um, and uh, how, you know, uh, I know uh, the Midwest because I raced there and I trained there and I lived there. Uh, 
Yep. How do you prepare your dog team and uh, when do you start your training uh, with ATV and uh, how far do you go and uh, what distance would you like to be at when you hit those mountains? So I usually wait till it's, the temperature gives me, you know, 50 degrees or under before I hook up a dog team, which in late August, early September means we got to get up pretty early. Um, up until then, I do a lot of free running. I have some free run pens where they run free, and I have them chasing snow, uh, four-wheelers and ATVs out there. Um, but then I start hooking up 16 to 18 dogs in a team, um, starting out at three miles, you know, making two to three-mile increments, maybe three to four, four runs each increment. Um, I'm hoping that before, for the new state stop and for what we're training for now, I'm hoping that right around Christmas time I can get my first and last 35s, 36s in there. We show the dogs two or three of those, and then we back down and, you know, we try to specialize in the 22, 23-mile range, try to speed the dogs up and keep them ready. Um, coming into stage stop, we, we go get acclimated about two weeks early. Um, I don't know that that's necessary anymore. One thing I've noticed with the new training program and running faster is the dogs acclimate way faster, way different. They're out of breath. Is I mean, they almost, it's like two runs into it. I'm like, wow, I'm so impressed. We're the old days when I used to train slower and not show much speed, it would take a week for them to breathe. It's, it's been very impressive as to the difference in the cardio and the dog teams. When you talk about uh, training faster or when you train slower, what type of speed are you talking about, Bruce? So on my slope poles on the ATVs, I'll go as slow as six or eight. I mean, there, I might even hit two or three on some of the uphills. And then uh, speed work or pace work is, you know, somewhere between – on a four-wheeler, 15 to 16 miles an hour. So I'm assuming you allow your dogs to trot or even walk if uh, the hills are there and you decide to go really slow, correct? That is correct. I've tried, I've tried not to allow that in a few years, and my team was very weak uphill. Okay, it was actually uh, backfiring. That, that was my experience. Yeah, I was back for it. Uh, so when you get uh, to those races and when you sit, you know, uh, start going uh, through those uh, hills and mountains and everything, what I noticed, the trail conditions are not the same as what I am used to in Alaska or the sprinters are used to around the around Oh, the not even close. Uh, tell me about that and how you prepare a dog team going through that. And uh, what about the booties? What about the feet? What about the feet care? Okay, first I'll tell you a, a little a quick little story that last year, uh, one of his first runs I met uh, Jake Robinson at Alpine. Let him with my snowmobile because I had a snowmobile out there. We went a two or three mile run so he could warm his dogs up and he came back and he said, why would you guys run such good dogs on such bad trails? <laughs> and, and, and for us it was an average trail and it was a big introduction to Jake to see it and he had a phenomenal state stop and a phenomenal year after state stop. Hopefully he loves it and we see him back. He was great fun to race with and a great competitor. Um, as far as booties and feet, the old stage stop in my old trading program, we used to wear lots of booties, protect lots of feet. But what I found out now is there's a big difference between walking and running. Um, we get way less injuries keeping our dogs out of booties. Um, you know, the feet get less sore. You, you, we fight some splits, but we treat, we, we treat them every day. We work on their feet. We try to we try to breed a dog with tougher feet, but actually, at the speeds we're trying to travel, it's almost unfair to run booties, and you cannot win stage stop running booties. And I don't think it's fair to your dog team in the new stage stop when we're all actually all you know running all the time. I don't actually think, in my opinion, it's safe to wear much booties because we can work on fixing feet, sore feet, but we we can't help with sore shoulders and other injuries. So, as I got rid of my booties, I had way less injuries. Uh, Bruce, uh, I have a question for you. I didn't mean to uh, jump in on KP, but no worries. You, you keep saying uh, old stage stop versus new stage stop. Uh, for most of the people that listen to this show, they're not uh, dog mushers. They're just dog owners, so they may not know the difference when you say that. Can you briefly describe what was the big change? I know you had mentioned campouts and all that, but has it changed in other ways as well? So the biggest changes are our first leg used to be 60 miles. We used to have 75 mile legs with our shortest distance being 45 miles. Today, our longest distance is 35 miles 
and our other distances are we were, we're basically four stages at 30 and four stages at 35 so this um the only difference we made there is we went from 12 dog teams down to 10 dog teams 16 dog pool down to 14 dog pool um so the speed is elevated greatly because of the shorter mileage Gotcha, gotcha, and, and and that that explains a lot. And now it's it's uh, a bunch of, uh, I guess, in layman's terms, it could be a bunch of sprint races put together over a week or so, compared to in years past, where it was a a little bit of everything, wasn't it? It was a little bit of everything, and I think some of the things when people have come for the first time now to the race now, they're shocked at how fast how fast we're going for so often. I mean, because. When we're not climbing, we're up in the mountains, we're going over rolling hills, and you better be, if you want to compete, you better be maintaining 17 to 18 miles an hour all the time. It's a, it's a very fast and deceivingly fast race. Yeah, you're talking about the speed, Bruce, and uh, it is actually uh, fascinating. Uh, this year, I uh, wasn't able to run the, the ONAC. We didn't have enough uh, dogs to do that, but I watched it closely, and blew my mind to see uh, dog teams like Annie's or uh, uh, the Streeper Kennel uh, going that fast, breaking track records, like literally weeks after uh, coming back from those mountains and training only at, I don't know, 16 or 17 miles an hour up to 20 miles an hour on the Onac Trail. How do you explain that, Bruce? I, I think it's explained that the race, the, one of the things that changed a lot at stage top is now we're going faster downhill. We're taking advantages of any place. Basically, I look at it when the dog's going to run, let him run. Because um, we have to make up time. We cannot give back time. Um, we don't, the, whole down, the holding the pace down for the 40 and 50 miles has been eliminated. We still pace our dogs. As So you guys had a great interview for Terry where he talked about what he learned at stage top about pacing dogs. Yes. Um, but the first year we did this, Lena and I were talking and buddy, we were talking, we were like, wow, this is crazy. This is almost unfair. We're asking ONAC speeds of our dogs, but we're asking it for eight days in a row. Uh, when, when you're not climbing, it's a very, very stay stop. It's a very, very fast race. We actually, from talk, you know, with buddy and Lena and people, those of us now that have done the Ronde, stay stop is probably a faster race than the Ronde. Yeah, it, it would not surprise me, uh, uh, considering, like the dis- like you said, if you're going down a hill, obviously the gravity is helping and you're going full blast probably down, I don't know, 18, 19 miles an hour. Uh, on, uh, yeah, I used, to, I used to think we could get away with 17 miles an hour, 17 and a half downhill, and then I got passed by Eric LaForce like I was standing still. I was like, oh, there's an eye opener. Yeah, interesting. Uh, of course, this year we had uh, this stage stop uh, in a fairly unusual uh, format with covid Tell us how COVID affected the overall race and the interactions between the mushers and the public on this race. Well, the, the nice thing, we have to give a lot of respect to the organization for pulling off anything during COVID for anybody who tried and anybody who stuck with it. Um, pedigree stood behind the race 100%. Um, the team talked to all the community. Hello. Hello. Food is that one communities uh, were able to gave us. The communities were still so open and so wanted us there, even though they couldn't partake as much. There's been years where we bring, you know, there's be seven, eight, ten busloads of kids, but there was nobody, you know, but very few at the start and finish of this year. So the guys who came for the first time didn't get ex- didn't really get to experience the hospitality of all the towns. They embrace us coming every year, but they did get to embrace how pedigree stands behind us and sports our world of dog mushing so great. So uh, what about the inter- interaction between the, uh, between the drivers? Were you able to chat or gather together or hang out? Or no, you were isolated uh, going, every one of you got to run, in, run its own way, basically. We were tested three times for COVID during the race. So we all became our own little bubble. Um, when we were outside of our truck areas, they still asked us to wear masks. So we could, I mean, the socialization was not as much as normal, but there was still some, but we were, we were asked as a whole team and a whole unit to wear masks when we left the vicinity of our truck, which I would think that I would, I, I personally would say that we were masked up 85, 90% of the time as a whole group being respectful and 
for the pedigree team even trying to get us there. And um, I think we were tested at uh, day five. We were tested at the end, and we were tested at the um, uh, vet check. Bruce, at, no, at no expense to us. Which is good, which is good. Bruce, Bonner, you are one of the uh, very few uh, uh, lower 48 drivers who uh, made uh, the uh, stage stop successfully and made it up to Alaska and uh, raced among the uh, – the you know crown jewel of our sprint sport uh, Onak and Rendezvous and all of those races. Uh, explain to me how you compare stuff that you see down in the lower 48 uh, and uh, the circuit you uh, encounter uh, in Alaska. Well, I was fortunate enough that when I got to I, I ran the paw a couple times preparing myself to learn how to run faster. And when I went to Alaska, I was fortunate enough to get to train in Fairbanks a couple of times, and I've never seen, never experienced a trail even similar to that hard in that nice trail. When people talk about nice trails, I'm like, yeah, you, you know, we're pretty happy if it's two inches of loose stuff. We're saying this is an awesome hard trail. I ne now I understand how dogs can go so fast. And when I went to the Ronde, it was a beautiful trail. Um, people were fantastic, really enjoyed myself. But it is, it is a little bit of a different world than what we ask in the, in the, in the constant pace. And that's one thing that um, is very different for me because, you know, stage stop has an ebb and flow of wide open, slow down, go to work, where the ONAC and the Ronde seem to be, you know, and, and, and same with the PAW, seem to be more of ingraining the pace into your dogs. So it's a big learning curve for me, especially to learn how to pace and run my dogs with you guys. But I, I appreciate it. I was very well war welcomed. And I was sitting at the ONAC when it was canceled that year, and we made that trek home very disappointed that we didn't get to stay and run the ONAC in, in uh, Tope. And you said uh, next year you're hoping to come and do the circuit in Alaska after the uh, state stop? We'll certainly be back, yes. That's fantastic. It will be a pleasure to see you guys again um, up here and uh, be able to race you around the uh, circuit here. Um, Talk about I mean, there's for someone like me, there's so much to learn from all you guys just being around watching and, you know, and, and seeing all the ph ph phenomenal athletes that everybody's training out there. It's just it's great. And you guys are very open to us coming up and running with you guys. We, we appreciate that you share so much. Uh, tell us about, uh, you know, I always ask this question. Tell us about your uh, your nutrition program during the off season and uh, race season, uh, how you uh, feed your canine athletes. So, 100% uh, of the year, I'm on Caribou Creek, um, and then when I start, and somewhere around August, I had a meat mix diet. Um, I worked with um, Arlie Reynolds, and I worked with uh, Mike Davis out of Oklahoma State, and developed a, a meat mix that's made by a, a, a mink farmer up here named Greg Jander, and he's phenomenal to all of us guys. We can get meat from him, and he's very reasonable. And then I use um, Dr. Tim's Immu Shield. Along with I get asked xanthan for Dr. Tim, wheat germ oil, fish oil. We combine it all, and I feed that through probably April. Okay, so you carry the carry the program, uh, basically the training and the diet all the way through from the beginning to the end of the season. Then, yes, yeah, and I keep them on the Caribou Creek, the good, the, you know, the good good kibble, one hundred percent of the year, all year long. Bruce, uh, talk about the. Uh, tell us about the journey coming from uh, the lower 48 and doing the Alcan uh, through with your uh, with your big rig. And uh, a lot of people they don't do this journey. I mean, we're not Alaskans. We don't travel really. We have the, all the races right around us, so uh, we don't see that. Uh, I know that uh, my partners Ken and Lori Chizik, of course, they make this trip. Uh, but uh, tell us how intricate it can be. Well, first off, I'm hoping that you guys change and we get to see all you guys at stage stop so we can continue to race against each other all year instead of just the end of the year. Um, but as far as the traveling, um, the border has been, you know, I mean, the border can be a hit and miss, but they've been fantastic to work with. Uh, we, when we crossed, we cross over in Montana and uh, North Dakota when we headed to the park. Usually we go to the, we usually we've been going to the pond, then up to Alaska. Um, the nice part about my rig is I have sleeping quarters, so I don't have to worry so much about where I stop, but I have to worry about fuel. I have to worry about carrying enough meat and about enough kibble um, to make sure I can make my whole trip to try to keep, try to do the best I can to keep my dogs on the exact same diet they've been on all year long. 
Um, there are there is meat available on the trail. People can help you get it. Uh, but I I actually got when I went to Alaska, I restocked up when I was in the pa. I had a friend come run my dog in the six dog class and re bring me meat and kibble. As far as you know, going on the net, all we got to do is watch our fuel, watch our times as we travel along the Alaskan Highway, because you know we we're, we're down to with my rig, I'm down to about ten miles to the gallon, so I can go about eh, two hundred and fifty miles safely on one gas one, one gas up. So, but the road's not bad. We we actually had a very good trip on our way back and forth, and it went very smoothly. So you gas up how many times a day? Oh, I don't I don't even have a guess. <laughs> um, I don't. I don't even have a guess, and I don't even know that I want to count. <laughs> That's but a you lot don't have of guess. Wait that long for a break. Everybody, everybody gets on the routine that says we're going to stop in three hours or three and a half hours. So whatever you got to do, you wait till we all stop together, and you better because next time we stop is when we gas up again, or <laughs> and we rotate. So we get we gas up, we drop dogs, we gas up, we drop dogs. We, it kind of works out perfectly on a it's you know on a four hour cycle all the time. You know, it's interesting. I talk to these uh, these open drivers like yourself traveling, and none of those guys they want to calculate how much money they spend <laughs> when they're coming up to Alaska oh, no, or don't traveling. E- we don't even want to bring that up. No, <laughs> it's no. a sore subject, right? <laughs> <laughs> it's a subject that we don't even want to discuss. Very good. Very good. So, Bruce, uh, if you've listened to our show, you probably know what's coming up next, and that is uh, if a person is just getting involved in the sport and you are able to offer them one piece of advice, what would you tell them? Well, it's a long piece of advice. One is find somebody to work with that you can trust. Find what kind of format that you think you can brace you in, what kind of dogs you enjoy running, and work with someone to get quality dogs. And as was told to me early on, buy dogs as long as you can because it's easier to buy a good dog than it is to raise a good dog. I like that last piece of advice. Uh, KP and I were just talking before you came on air about uh, breeding and how few litters we've had over the years. And I think that that's, that, that's great advice is, is, uh, is to buy them if you can. Uh, I, I really enjoyed speaking with you, Bruce. Do you have anything else for him before we go? Uh, no, Bruce, uh, I actually 100% agree with you. Buy a good dog instead of trying to just uh, make your own magic and uh, create, uh, recreate the wheel. Uh, no, Bruce, I uh, thank you so much for spending the last uh, uh, 30 minutes with us. Uh, I really enjoyed chatting with you and uh, really, really looking forward to uh, follow your uh, your. Uh, uh, track record and your race during the pedigree race and uh, to see you come up here and race us uh, on our circuit uh, and uh, good luck with your summer and good luck with your training thank you very much look forward to sharing the trail with you guys very good on behalf of our guest today and my co-host kp this is robert for the dog driver show be sure to hit that subscribe button and if you like our show please share with your friends we have had people talking about us all over the world and uh, how they listen to our show before they're on. So we really appreciate the sharing and the love that we get from you guys, and uh, we hope to continue to bring it for you in the future. So with that, we'll see you guys next time. Goodbye. From First Paw Media, this is The Dog Driver Show. We hope you enjoyed this podcast, and we invite you to subscribe in Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you get your podcasts. You'll find a link on the episode notes. You can tap or swipe on the episode cover art, and you can see some offers from our sponsors. You can support our show by supporting them. If you like what you have heard, we would love it if you could give us a five-star rating and tell your friends how to subscribe, too. Your hosts are Robert Forto and Kurosh Parto. Our producer is Robert Forto and created for First Paw Media.